Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, welcome to the 15th lecture of this course, Fracture, Fatigue and Failure of Materials. In this lecture, we will be talking about some more facts on the J integral and the concept that will be covered in this lecture is primarily uh, the physical basis of J integral and J1C as well as how to determine that experimentally. So, in the last lecture, we have seen that J integral is basically obtained for any contour and let us say we have a crack tip and we are talking about a contour in the immediate vicinity of this crack tip such that this is with tau 1 and starting from the point A and moving to B and then C with another contour the direction of which the direction of motion being opposite to that of the tau 1 and finally, uh, the surface segment d a is closing it. So, we have seen that for every point of this a relation is valid which is given by j equals to the integration of w d y minus t i del u i del x. This entire relation is valid for each of the points and then this is integrated over the entire contour or the segments and then we are eventually getting the overall j integral value for this. And uh, physically what it means is if we have a stress strain curve for a certain component let us say a CT specimen or even a ACNB specimen and there is a certain crack length of length A. So, it forms a stress strain curve or a load displacement curve for that matter. So, load versus displacement curve will be something like this since it is having a plastic deformation which is uh, inevitable in case of J integral determination. So, if this is the one for the crack length A and then since the crack is growing uh, or we are doing the experiment on another specimen with a slightly different crack length of A plus D A, there will be a fall in the load and that should be something like this. If the displacement is constant. So, eventually we are getting this zone as the difference in the area which is signifying the energy that is required for the crack to grow from A to A plus delta A. Okay. So, this also looks familiar to what we have seen in the concept of G the strain energy release rate. J integral also signifies the total amount of pseudo potential energy that is being released as the crack is growing or per unit growth of the crack length. So, that leads us to the very important uh, concept of J integral is that consisting of two major parts the elastic part as well as the plastic component. So, elastic part actually signifies the brittle fracture or the unstable fracture in which there is no crack extension. Once the crack starts to grow, let us say from here or there, it immediately leads to fracture. So, that is the elastic or the unstable fracture mode and uh, that is given by G. So, that is the same as that uh, explained for G that we have seen for the elastic part of this curve we have seen that it follows a straight line for the P versus V or the load versus displacement curve for a condition 1. Let us say it gets a point of P 1 
and V 1, while if e are, it is uh, growing by A plus delta A term for the elastic part, it will have a drop in the load and an enhancement in the displacement. So, this will lead to P 2 and displacement of V 2. Okay. So, that leads to a change in the energy that is being released which can be determined from the difference in this potential energy and eventually we can get the uh, factor G. We can also explain this in a simplified form with uh, respect to its relation with K and that has been first intro introduced uh, by Arvin while uh, Griffith criterion has been modified when we have seen that the sigma f which is nothing but the fracture strength determined by Griffith criterion and that is equivalent to root over E g by pi a or we can rearrange this relation sigma f root over pi a being same as k. So, we can actually write k equals to root over E g or in other word g is given by k square by E. So, that means that for the elastic part of this j integral, j elastic is actually given by g or k square by E, but it is not only E rather it is E prime because we are talking about the plane stress condition now and we have to consider the Poisson's ratio or the contraction in the perpendicular direction to this. Okay, so, that is actually given by E by 1 minus mu square, where mu is the Poisson's ratio and E is the elastic modulus. Okay. Typically, the value of mu for metallic materials is around 0 0.33. So, this is for metals it can have a different values for different kinds of material. So, that is what we have seen for the J elastic and now moving on to J plastic. J plastic actually signifies some amount of crack extension due to the presence of notable plastic zone size which is uh, which cannot be ignored anymore and that leads to a stable fracture means the crack propagation is slow unlike the unstable one that we have seen for the elastic component. So, in this case the J plastic is actually is dependent on several factors such as eta which is a constant and it depends on the specimen configuration and A, A is the area under the load displacement curve. So, that uh, can be obtained from a relation like this if we know the load and the, uh, the displacement then up to the critical displacement at which fracture occurs, we can integrate this uh, entire zone from 0 to V c and eventually we can find out this entire area, this hatched uh, section here which signifies the plastic area particularly. Okay. So, if we can do that, we can get the value of A and B capital B is the specimen thickness and small b is the ligament length which is uh, dictated by the difference between the width of the component and the crack length of the component. So, this is the zone, this is the region where all the plastic deformation starts or uh, particularly happens within this area. So, that is what is of significance and that is why we consider this small b term very uh, um, clearly. Also, we uh, can also see that uh, the J plastic term is particularly dependent on the thickness which uh, and that too inversely related to the thickness which means more is the thickness as the specimen is getting thicker and thicker the J component the plastic component of J is actually decreasing. Okay. Lower the value of B which means that thinner the component is J plastic increases. So, that is what we have seen earlier also that how the plane stress fracture toughness is dependent on the thickness and not only that thinner the specimen gets more and more the fracture toughness uh, increases under plane stress condition or in uh, vice versa as the specimen or the component or the structure gets thicker and thicker 
fracture toughness values reduce until it reaches the plane strain condition when it is sufficiently thick so that it encompasses uh, the plastic zone well in within such that the plastic zone is almost one tenth of the thickness and then we can achieve the plane strain condition and the fracture toughness value is not changing any further. But we are well aware that one of the major disadvantage of plane stress fracture toughness is that it always varies and we have to consider this very carefully. Okay. So, that means that eventually if we want to find out this J integral, we have to compute both the elastic and the plastic components of this and the summation of this both these components will give us the overall J integral value. And from there we can calculate not only J integral, but more specifically J 1 C. So, J 1 C characterizes the toughness at a uh, crack tip and near the outset of crack extension. So, this once again as we have seen this for the plane strain fracture toughness uh, which is termed as K 1 C here the J 1 C typically signifies the plane stress fracture toughness. So, let me just write it down here. So, uh, J 1 C represents the plane stress fracture toughness. And obviously, that means that the critical value of J integral at which fracture occurs that critical value is termed as J 1 C. So, C stands for this critical and once again as we have seen this for K 1 C that 1 actually stands for mode 1 or the crack opening mode when the loading direction is perpendicular to the crack tip direction and that makes it the worst possible scenario and we always want to predict the fracture toughness in the worst possible condition. So, that in service it may not have this kind of worst situation and we can have a higher value of the fracture toughness. So, eventually that means that J 1 C can be obtained if we uh, can obtain the critical value for the elastic and the plastic component right. Since J 1 C elastic is given by this relation here. So, this is given by k square by E multiplied by 1 minus mu square and J 1 C plastic is given by eta A plus B B. So, at the point of fracture if we are able to find this out. So, this will be k 1 C square then and we will be eventually able to find out the J 1 C. So, again as I mentioned that the eta factor is dependent on the specimen dimensions and the specimen configuration. So, let us see uh, this for the two most important configuration or most widely used specimen uh, configurations which are used for J integral testing. One is the ACNB or single edge nose beam specimen which is used for three point bend specimen okay, or the flexure test uh, kind of, but in this case we have a crack length which has uh, this half length of A and all the other dimensions are maintained as per the ASTM standard. And what we see here is the span length which is the distance between the two loading points this should be 4 times the width of the specimen. And if such is the case then once again J i or the total J integral will be the, uh, the summation of the elastic and the plastic component. And for this plastic component, elastic component we already know that this is given by k 1 c square uh, divided by E by 1 minus mu square, but for the plastic part we have the eta or the materials constant that is equivalent to 2. Okay. So, that makes the plastic part as 2 a by b b. So, let me write down the total term here then. So, J 1 C will be given by K 1 C square 1 minus mu square by E plus 2 A by B and B. Okay. On the other hand, uh, there is another kind of specimen which is very much used for fracture toughness uh, testing and that is the compact tension specimen uh, also known as the compact specimen. 
most particular term will be compact tension specimen and this is also denoted as C T. So, this is the geometry of the compact tension specimen again following the ASTM standard and in this case the elastic part is same as that we have seen for any other kind of specimen, but the twist is that in this case eta has a value of 2 plus 0 0.522 and the ratio of B by W. So, this B is the ligament length. So, essentially this is what is B here small b and the ratio of this multiplied by 0.522 and that added with this two term will give us the overall eta. Okay, so, that makes J 1 C the elastic part being the same but we have certain differences particularly for the eta part and that makes a difference in the overall value. So, this multiplied by a and then we have b times b. Okay. So, if we look into this carefully look into this relations we will see that the first part the elastic part for both the cases we can determine even without doing the test. For example, this k 1 c which is the standard fracture toughness values and since this is a constant value which is not supposed to change anymore and the lowest one we know now that the plane strain fracture toughness value can be quoted as the standard fracture toughness value of the materials property. So, this k 1 c for most of the materials are also available in the standard handbook. So, we can obtain the values from there mu is also or the Poisson's ratio for most of the materials are also known and same goes for the elastic modulus as well. We can get these values from the literature itself. So, we can eventually calculate the elastic component which is nothing but the g uh, basically. So, based on all these parameters obtained from the literature values we can calculate that even without doing the experiment. Coming to the plastic part again uh, this B and B both the uh, small and the capital B which means the ligament length and the thickness this can be obtained from the specimen dimensions even before doing the experiment right. So, uh, and that goes for eta value also at least for these two configurations of AC and B and uh, compact tension specimen. So, the only factor that we cannot determine without doing the experiment is the A right the area under the curve and that makes us do the experiment. So, that we can precisely determine the plastic part and this also varies a lot uh, if we are changing the material, if we are changing the dimensions uh, overall and as a result we are getting all the differences in the values. So, let us see how uh, experimentally J 1 C is determined because after uh, learning all the concepts as well as the physical significance as well as the formulas uh, giving us the j integral or the j 1 c values, we finally need to implement this to perform an experiment to get the values in for real material. So, that we can use this value for the application scenario. So, we can do this using multiple specimens okay, uh, uh, specimens of similar configurations, but they might have different crack length or we can load it so that the crack grows up to different levels. So, this is the multiple specimen method and in this case uh, let us say we are using a three point bend specimen or compact uh, tension specimen and we are loading different specimens. Uh, to achieve varying amount of crack extension. So, we are loading it like this. So, this is for specimen 1 and uh, it has some amount of plastic deformation and then we are uh, not using that specimen anymore and we are coming back to uh, another specimen of same configuration and this is the load versus displacement curve for specimen 2. This has been shifted from the origin to make this clear, but actually all these graphs should merge with one another. The elastic part will merge with one another and we will see some differences in the plastic part. Okay. So, four specimens has been shown here as an example that how we can get the 
load versus displacement curve for the four different specimens which are for each of these cases actually there are uh, slightly varying or slightly different amount of total crack length or the load that has been applied is different which leads to different crack length. Now, after we have done this specimen actually what we need to know is how much the crack has been extended. Initially, we have a specimen that has been machined with a notch right. Let us say that we I'm giving an example of a CT specimen here. So, this is the notch when we say that this is A, this is actually this notch is machined ok. And what we need to figure out is that how much it is extended as we are applying certain amount of load and this can be obtained if we are heat tinting. Okay, so, tinting means just the discoloration or giving it a different color. So, what happens is that if we are breaking the specimen or uh, if we are simply heating this and then breaking it, we will look into the fracture surface which will uh, look like something like this. So, this part here is the machined notch which has been there right from the beginning and because of the, uh, the load variation or whatever load that we are applying this is the crack extension part. We can see here like a loop that we are getting an arch the crack extension. Uh, this actually gets a different color if we are heat uh, heating it and that is why this is known as heat tinting. It is getting a different color because it is very interesting because this is nothing but a free surface a crack is nothing but a free surface and when we are when or when the crack is growing it is a freshly formed free surface. So, very much reactive to anything when we are heating it is the free surface that is getting oxidized first mostly happens for the case of steels or uh, some other materials which are reactive to oxygen most of the metallic systems are and as a result of this there is a difference in the color between this crack the newly formed crack lens versus the machined one. And based on that if we break open that we can figure out very distinctly and very clearly what is the crack extension part. Now, this forms like an arch. So, we need to measure this also carefully and typically it is measured at 5 different places near the edges and near the center and then 2 places which are in between the center and the edges. So, we uh, measure this at 5 different places and then the average value is taken as you can see here this is the delta A average value that is considered. Okay. So, once we have that uh, for all the broken specimen we can record this value of delta A we also know the corresponding load displacement curve for this particular specimen. So, we can determine this in this case for all the 4 specimen. Now, once we do that our next target is to find out the area under this load displacement curve right. So, since we have uh, so this is from the specimen itself and now coming back to the load and displacement curve we can determine the area under the curve in a, with a, a similar way that uh, we have discussed the plastic part and uh, based on that we can calculate the plastic component of J as well. And the elastic part is uh, simply dependent on the k and the e as well as the mu values. So, we can determine the elastic part also. So, eventually so far uh, we can determine the delta a and we can determine the elastic and the plastic component of j uh, integral values. So, that we can have the j as well as delta a values for each of the specimen. Now, once we have that we plot the j versus delta a curve. This looks something like this. So, this is uh, for the 4 specimen that we can see here. Uh, we can see the corresponding j 1 c value or so far this is actually the j uh, q value we will uh, come to that and the, the j integral value for now let us name this as j integral for all the 4 specimen. So, this is 1 and this is for specimen 4 and the corresponding del A values also we are getting for specimen 1, specimen 2, 3 and 4. Okay. 
Now that signifies the j value, but we are yet to find out that what is the critical value of j at which fracture occurs. How can we say that this is the amount of j that is required for the fracture to materialize? How can we come to that? So, for that we need the help of a blunting line. Okay. So, this signifies uh, the relation between j, so j blunt we can say and this is related to the flow stress and the crack growth okay twice the crack growth actually okay this flow stress is nothing but it is the average of the yield and ultimate tensile strength of the material so this takes care of the any kind of work hardening strain hardening behavior of the material as well so that means that if we can figure so that is taking care of the plastic deformation part right so if we can get this blunting line itself uh, and plot it here it starts from the origin and you can see that it has a very steep slope and the point of interaction or wherever this two cuts out this is the point which is termed as j q okay the intersection between the j line as well as the blunting line so this is the j line Okay, that is the JQ value. Since we are mentioning the uh, term Q, you might be getting familiar with uh, the concept of KQ that uh, we have been introduced during the determination, experimental determination of K1C, which means that this is not yet a finalized value. We still need to validate this and for validating this actually what we need is uh, this concept of uh, JQ will be equivalent to J1C or we can term this as the plane stress fracture toughness only when it satisfies this criteria that the thickness as well as the ligament length is greater than 25 times this ratio. Okay. So, if we are getting the value of J, we can plug this value of J here, put it in this relation JQ and the yield strength of the material can be obtained from the literature or we can perform a tensile test and uh, determine the yield strength this ratio multiplied by 25 if this factor is uh, being less than the b both the b values which means the ligament value as well as the thickness then we can safely say that jq is equivalent to j1c okay now this is not arbitrary it is uh, not on our whim that we can say that uh, uh, we have to maintain this ratio there might be some particular reason for this right and the reason is that uh, we have to appreciate this that in case of plain stress fracture toughness whenever there is a crack and a plastic zone ahead of the crack we know that there is a effective crack length and eventually the crack is getting blunter right. So, it is very difficult unlike the plain strain fracture toughness it is very difficult to find out that at what point fracture is happening how much uh, tip blunting or how much extension of the crack can be considered as the critical value for the onset of the fracture and for that we need to validate through this relation. Like for the case of K1C we have used this second line which has a slope less than 5 degree than the tangent line and that signifies that the crack is growing by 2 percent. In this case instead of 2 percent we actually uh, use a value. Uh, so, this relation 25 jq by sigma y s stands on uh, the fact that there is a crack extension by 0.2 millimeter. So, there is a finite crack extension and that finite uh, limit is 0.2 millimeter. Then only we can say that uh, j uh, uh, q whatever value of j q that we have obtained that is nothing but the j 1 c and that signifies the onset of cracking or the onset of fracture. Okay. So, this is being maintained and you can see here that there is the plastic zone which is forming at this point here. So, that signifies the plastic deformation and if you look that carefully you can see that there is a crack tip blunting as well. So, initially the crack was even sharper and just in this clip itself you can see that the crack tip is getting more and more blunt. 
So, basically the effective crack length is increasing. Okay. Now, in a similar way like we have seen this for the multiple specimen, we can also determine uh, the plane stress fracture toughness based on a single specimen in which for each of the specimen we are repeatedly unloading this up to certain percentage like 10 percent or so we are unloading and then again we are loading it back and unloading and repeatedly unloading and loading. Okay. So, this is a way by which we can conserve material, we can use just one specimen to determine the fracture toughness and in a similar fashion uh, we get the load displacement curve and reduce it by around 10 percent uh, and the specimen compliance is measured from the unloading curve. From the compliance we can also measure uh, the, uh, the k value, the g value etcetera and this loading unloading is continued. And for each of this, we can also calculate the J plastic and from a series of uh, such kind of test, ultimately the J values both the elastic and the plastic components are determined and uh, summed and finally, we also get the J versus delta A curve. Okay. Uh, again, by heat tinting or any other method, we can distinctly uh, see the steps in which the crack has been grown. So, we can plot the J versus delta A curve and once again using the blunting line and the intersection point on a similar fashion as we have seen for the multiple uh, specimen method, we can determine the J q and in case this validates this relation uh, that is uh, the thickness as well as the ligament length is greater than 25 times uh, J q by sigma y s, we can safely say, say that that value is the J 1 c. Okay. So, coming to the conclusion, uh, we have seen that J 1 C consists of both the elastic and the plastic components and the elastic component is nothing, but this is exactly equivalent to the G value. So, the G 1 C value, whereas the plastic part is particularly dependent on the value on the factor eta, which is dependent on the specimen configuration. So, eta for uh, a C and B specimen or eta for a compact tension specimen are different and this is again one characteristics of plane stress fracture toughness that it depends on the not only the specimen dimension, specimen configuration and it changes as the value of thickness or any other parameters change. J 1 C correspond to the onset of cracking at that point it is termed as J 1 C and it can be determined based on multiple specimens or repeated loading unloading in case we have just a single specimen and particularly uh, we determine J 1 C on uh, considering the fact that there is a 0.2 millimeter of crack extension that has led to the fracture. So, that is the basis of validating the obtained J q value to uh, J 1 C values. So, these are some of the references that has been used for this lecture. Thank you very much.